And it's time for Lefties Losing It. Now here is a vile, vile lefty celebrating a deadly, devastating hurricane hitting Republican states. These people are evil. So when I seen the hurricane hit North Carolina and Tennessee, the first thing I thought was, damn, there goes some racists. There, there we go, we got some gone. And then I just seen this video that like the area it hit is like sun downtown after sun downtown after sun downtown and they are just completely flattened and gone. And I was like, God's work, God's work. I have no words for that really. And I regret to inform you now that Kamala is back at it, back with the word salads, the non-answers, the endless references to her childhood when asked serious questions about the economy and small business. Just uh, listen to this mess. Moving forward for people who are living paycheck to paycheck yeah. and, and struggling for groceries and, and, and rent and, and homeowners. So look, I grew up so my, my sister and I were raised by our mother. We lived for a long time on, in an apartment on top of a, a child care center. That child care center was actually owned by a woman who lived two doors down from us, Mrs. Shelton, who was, by all of our accounts and feelings, our second mother. She helped raise us. And so she was a small business owner. So I'll start with the small business and congratulations on what you, you guys have done. You. I, from a child, knew who our small business owners are, right? Um, so she knew from when she was a child what a small business owner was because she knew one. Great. What has that got to do with anything? Maybe there will be an answer to a straightforward question in this next bit. Fingers crossed. I mean, you're, you're business leaders, but you're also civic leaders. You take seriously your voice in how you can mentor, how you can grow right, communities and the sense of communities. I love our small businesses. And so a lot of my work in terms of building and growing the economy has focused on small businesses. Um, and, and my vision overall is we need to build an opportunity economy in which we increase opportunity for all, including small business owners. So I've been responsible for billions of dollars more now going into our community banks because they're in the community and then they know who's in the community and who's where the, the town the is and who's doing good mm -hmm. in the community, what the community wants. Mm -hmm. Yes, community banks, they're in the community, for the community, yeah. Spending billions, that sounds a bit like communism. Doesn't sound like she has any idea about small business. And here is further proof of that. Here is Kamala with Hollywood actress Jessica Alba. Jessica Alba? Even she looks a little bit confused about this. First of all, Latina small businesses are the fastest growing in the country. Yes, they are. Right, right. Yes, they are. But included in that is that we don't lack for people who have ambition and have aspirations and dreams and, a, and an idea that is a great idea and work ethic. Mm. But not everybody has access to the capital. It's so true. And I believe strongly that our small businesses are the backbone of America's economy. Mm. So when we grow and strengthen small businesses, we all benefit. Now, this is a miracle. There's actually a funny skit from Saturday Night Live. Uh, get ready to laugh. Listen up, everyone. We couldn't have gotten here without one man, and his name is Joe Biden. <laughs> get on out here, Joe Biden. That's right. A lot of people will forget I'm president, including me. But guess what? And by the way, I'm being serious right now. Come on. And guess what? And by the way, the fact of the matter is, the rich don't pay their fair share. Now, it doesn't get more wacky than this. Here is Fran Libowitz on Bill Maher's program advocating for President Joe Biden to abolish the Supreme Court. These are the people telling you Republicans are extremists and Trump is a threat to democracy. It's not even a court. It's only a court in the sense that the court of Louis XVI was a court. You know, I mean, basically, it's a harem. 
okay? It's a harem. It's Trump's harem. So I always feel sorry for the three real judges on the court. What Biden should do, not that you asked, but when they passed that law, the Supreme Court passed that ruling, you know, where they said, you're not the president, you're the king, which is what that ruling is. You can do whatever you want. You can never be, you know, held responsible. Biden should dissolve the Supreme Court. Dissolve the Supreme yeah. Court? I'm the president. I'm the king now, like you said, and go home. Okay. Even Bill Maher was looking at her like she was a complete wackadoodle. Uh, that, that these are mainstream figures in the left. They're not fringe figures and they are, well, their left is losing it. Now to Hurricane Helene, which has caused widespread destruction across a number of US states. But President Joe Biden, well, he is still president. He remained at his Delaware holiday home until earlier today. And he was none too pleased when asked about why he wasn't monitoring this catastrophic event from the White House, like, you know, you'd expect the president to be doing. So you expect president. Iran to retaliate. And the hurricane, Mr. President, why weren't you and Vice President Harris here in Washington commanding this this weekend? I was commanding. I was on the phone for at least two hours yesterday and the day before as well. I command. It's called a telephone. Is it all my security people. Is it not important for the country to see? Now, plenty more lefties content with my next guest. And yes, we've already seen Joe Biden lounging at the beach as states are devastated in the aftermath of Hurricane Helene, which has caused widespread destruction in Florida, Georgia, North and South Carolina, as well as Tennessee and Alabama. Over 100 dead, many more still missing. President Trump has been on the ground. He's been speaking with those involved in rescue efforts. And they said they've never seen one this bad. Valdasta has been ravaged. The town is uh, very, very badly hurting. And many thousands are without power. They're running low on food and fuel. We'll endure. We will rebuild Valdasta and every other town that has been so badly hit. And we'll merge stronger and more united and more prosperous than ever before. You're going to be stronger, better. You're going to learn a lot from it. And again, we pray to God for those that have been so badly injured and for, in particular, for the people that are no longer with us. Joining me now is senior editor at large at Newsweek, Josh Hammer. Josh, the response of the president and the vice president, it must be said, has been a substandard. Yeah, I, I mean that might qualify as the understatement of of, of the century substandard. I, I mean, I mean Kamala Harris, I suppose, was bothered on social media to stage this photo op where she was trying to bamboozle the masses here into thinking that she was actually doing something. But in this photo, as some very astute people on X pointed out, she she has the, those iPhone earbuds that plug into your phone, but her phone is on the desk and she's pretending to be on a phone call. It's not even plugged in. It's not even plugged in. And there's and there's a piece of paper in front of her as if she's taking notes from the FEMA director. It's a blank piece of paper. I, I mean, you know, if you're gonna fake it and try to make it look like you're making it, you know, you know, at least don't don't just do do it this poorly. I mean, I mean, try to try to make it look like you're at least attempting to cover your tracks for God's sake. Meanwhile, Joe Biden. Who, who has never been more clearly out to launch is confusing a labor strike with the Israeli strike on the Houthis. They asked him for what he thought about the Israeli operation in Yemen. He said he supports collective bargaining as if it's, as if it's a labor dispute with the United Auto Workers in, in a picket line. I, 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 mean, I mean, this is just catastrophic incompetence. This, this is very much this administration's version of what happened to Hurricane Katrina under George W. Bush is actually much worse in terms of the incompetence. But back then, Kanye West infamously said that George W. Bush hates black people, which was a, a racist smear back then and is a smear today. But this very DEI, so-called equity-obsessed administration on, on the FEMA website today, I, I took a look earlier and I noted that they have diversity listed as their number one goal for the agency or agency for, for federal disasters. You know, this equity obsessed administration is currently leaving behind overwhelmingly disproportionately working class and poor white people in Appalachia in North Carolina. It is a horrific, horrific look this close to an election. And I've seen just some absolutely appalling commentary online on social media from people who are almost celebrating this because it's hitting Republican heavy areas. I mean, that sort of. Uh, Ugliness, callousness is just so depressing to see in America, but it certainly does exist 
Now, moving on, Josh, we've also seen some interesting polling numbers at, regarding the Hispanic vote in America. Listen to this breakdown of the data from NBC's Steve Konaki. We ask a basic question of Hispanic voters, which party do you more identify with? 37% now say Republicans, 49% say Democrats. But again, look at how this has shifted in just the last dozen years. In 2012, this was a 41-point advantage for the Democrats. It has come all the way down to 12 points, Kristen, a 29-point drop uh, in terms of uh, that gap there uh, on uh, which party Hispanics identify with in just 12 years. And Josh, I wouldn't be surprised if those figures are actually even close, closer on election day. What do you think has been behind this trend? It's a fairly dramatic realignment in just 12 years. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's it, it's actually not just Hispanic voters. It very much does include Hispanic voters, but young black men in particular are breaking for, for Republicans this, mm. this cycle like never before. Donald Trump could probably get up to 25% of the young black male vote. You know, even just younger Americans, the 18 to 35 demographic, you include millennials and Gen Z in there. You know, it's looking clearly to be a single digit margin. A, a few months ago, it was actually well within the margin of error. I wouldn't surprise me if it ended up there. You know, the, the Hispanic vote ha has been shifting very slowly, but very steadily towards the right for a very long time now. You know, Hispanic people in America are disproportionately Catholic. You have some evangelicals. You know, they're good common sense individuals who don't like being pandered to. And the Democratic Party, when it comes to Hispanic voters, they try to pander them by just encouraging more illegal immigration. They're a lot of problems with that. One, it's deeply infantilizing and belittling to assume that just because you happen to share a native language, among other things, with someone, then you support people entering the country illegally. Second, and probably even more to the point, a lot of the communities where Hispanic Americans hit are the hardest hit by the illegal alien invasion and all the crime and the drugs and the dr right. and, and the human trafficking, the sex trafficking. So, so it's a totally toxic stew right now. You know, it's interesting. If Donald Trump wins this election, which I actually do predict that he's going to do, he, he's going to do so with, with essentially a, a multi-ethnic working class coalition, the likes of which the Republican Party has really never had in modern times. And, you know, again, as someone who I, I hope that he wins, I, I just hope that he keeps it up. Yes, it will be interesting. You mentioned the black vote fracturing, uh, particularly amongst young black men. That's going to be fascinating to see because the... Uh the black uh, demographic has voted 90% plus for Democrats for so many years. So to, to fracture that is quite an achievement. Uh, now, I want to uh, get your comments on high-profile American author and social commentator Fran Leibovitz. She's a darling of the left. She's embarrassed herself again with these remarks on Bill Maher's show. show. The sad thing is, Josh, that many on the left agree with her about uh, her calls to have Joe Biden abolish the Supreme Court. What Biden should do, not that you asked, but when they passed that law, the Supreme Court passed that ruling, you know, where they said, you're not the president, you're the king, which is what that ruling is. You can do whatever you want. You can never be, you know, held responsible. <laughs> Biden should dissolve the Supreme Court. Dissolve the Supreme yeah. Court? It's incredible, Josh, that they say Donald Trump is the threat to democracy, threat to norms, threats to the republic, and the left of uh, mainstream this sort of nutty rhetoric. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm running out of how many norms or so-called norms to count that people on the left these days just continue to tear down. I, I mean, out of one end of the mouth, they are clamoring that Donald Trump is a world historical threat to American democracy. On the other end, they are openly calling for the abolition of one of our three branches of government established in Article 3 of the Constitution, the judicial branch. You know, otherwise, they have been trying to literally take Donald Trump off of the ballot. That was a case out of Colorado. It was the Trump versus mm -hmm. Anderson case at the U.S. Supreme Court. I can personally probably think of no more quintessentially undemocratic acts. If the word democracy means anything, it means the ability of the demos, the people, to actually vote for office. It doesn't get much more undemocratic than denying your opponent's actual ballot access. How about the fact that the Biden-Harris Merrick Garland administration is literally trying to bankrupt and incarcerate, yes, actually incarcerate the opposition. So-called <laughs> special counsel Jack Smith, who was a Democrat lawfare complex hitman, Jack Smith just filed a 180-page brief in their delusional January 6th case in Washington, D.C. That was his past Thursday. A day later on Friday, he filed a motion to actually make 
public most of that brief. Rita, there is one reason and one reason only why Jack Smith wants to make public in October, just before an election, all of the various details about January 6th. That is election interference, if I have ever seen it. it by the way, it goes right against the Department of Justice's own internal manual, which explicitly says you can't do that, but they're doing it anyway, and God willing, the voters of America will make them pay a price for it. The, the lawfare to me has been third world banana republic despot nation type behavior the, 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 to, as you said, essentially try to bankrupt and jail your leading political opponent. And, and we know these cases are trumped up, excuse the pun. Uh, they've created laws, they've to, to just get one person. Now, I want to ask you about abortion. It's an issue that gets plenty of coverage including in Australia, about what's happening in the US. And the debate is just littered with fake news, deliberate lies. Uh, and I'm thinking these lies are very dangerous, Josh. Uh, there was a recent one claiming that a woman died due to abortion bans in Georgia when the death was due to complications after the abortion pill was taken. And there's doctors in Georgia speaking out about these false claims. And I want to play you a clip here of Senator James Langford. He tried to get some clarity on this issue from Texas assistant, uh, former Texas assistant Solicitor General Heather Hacker to just clarify what is actual fact and what is uh, scaremongering. Ms. Hackler, just to clarify on this, are there any states where women face prosecution for having an abortion? No. Are there any states that criminalize miscarriage? No. Or that care for, any, uh, for a miscarriage? No. Are there any states that criminalize removing an ectopic pregnancy? No. Are there any states that prohibit life-saving care for the mother? No. Are there any states where women have to be actively dying for a, for a doctor to be able to act for her care? No. There's been a lot of rhetoric in this that I'm concerned pushes people away from getting access to health care. Josh, Kamala Harris has made claims of women being arrested for having a miscarriage. She claimed a woman died due to this. And let me quote her word for word here. She said, women are being denied care during miscarriages, some only being treated once they develop sepsis. And we know that women have died because of Trump abortion bans. This is not just disinformation, Josh, it's dangerous. If women think they're going to get arrested for having a miscarriage, they may not seek medical care and that could have catastrophic consequences. Well, that's actually literally what happened in Georgia. I mean, exactly what you just said is what happened. So this woman in Georgia, she, she, she took an abortion pill and by the way, the Democrats are singularly responsible for liberalizing the abortion pill. You can get it via telemedicine now. They'll mail it to you in the postal service. You know, no doctor supervision necessary or anything like that. You know, they're, and they advertise it as if the abortion pill, mifepristone usually, they advertise as if it's just as safe as popping a Tylenol or an Advil. Uh, unfortunately, we, we actually have data on this, and that's not, in fact, the case. And what happened to this woman in Georgia is she developed severe complications. And what you just said is what happened. She saw, she chose not to seek care. She didn't go to a hospital or the ER or anything because she thought that she couldn't be helped because she believed the left-wing media lies that in a situation like that, then you cannot get anything, anything literally anything to save the, the life of mother. Look, you know, Rita, I, I've been a pro-life activist for most of my adult life. I founded the Law Students for Life chapter at the University of Chicago Law School. I've spoken at pro-life conferences for years. I have never met a single pro-lifer of any ethical, religious, moral persuasion or anything who ever, ever, ever in a situation where, I, where, where a an unborn child's mother, a mother's life is actually on the line. Of course, you do whatever necessary has to be done. These are lies. These are grotesque lies. They are lies designed to gin up their base to fear monger and to scare people into, into voting for them. But it's totally, totally disingenuous. By the way, she also openly lied at the presidential debate as well when she said that Donald Trump supports a national abortion ban, much to the chagrin of, of, of ardent pro-lifers mm. such as myself. He does he does not. That's actually not his stance. I, I kind of wish that it was, but, but I understand politically why it's not. But he's very clear that it's back to the states and they're lying on that front as well, I should add. 
Well, yeah, the, the Supreme Court giving the power back to the states, it's precisely the situation here in Australia. The states make laws as a, in relation to abortion. And I know in the US you've got states that are uh, limit abortion and then you've got states that have got abortion right up to the end of the third trimester, pretty much with no term uh, limits on on when an abortion can be carried out. So that, that's, uh, that's again, that sort of nuance uh, is not being uh, reported on, certainly here in Australia, because I get so many questions from people about what's happening with abortion in America, and so much of it is misinformation, just blatant misinformation. Josh Hammer, thank you so much for your time this evening. Always a pleasure. Thank you.